Howdy, Larkin and Amanda here, and guess what? We are coming back to Anarchapulco this year, this February. February. And there's a number of things going on there that uh, we wanted to tell you about as reasons for you to be there, too. Um, three main things. The first one is I'm doing a talk there called Personal, Literal, and Specific Truth, which sounds like a weird title, and I'm not even going to exactly explain what it means. Here, you'll have to show up and hear it. Um, those of you who have done Candles in the Dark um, will have some guess of what it's about. Um, but it's the talk is for people who don't know that stuff, too. So that's just my main stage talk. But then we are doing a, a separate three-hour seminar um, with breaks so you don't die uh, called Making Anarchy Mainstream because there are lots and lots and lots of people now who understand the principles of self-ownership and voluntarism in a stateless society, and they're doing either a mediocre job or no job at all of making the rest of the world understand these things, and for understandable reasons, I know how frustrating it can be. Um, and there's also, there's also our, there's our seminar Candles in the Dark, which was specifically geared to teach, you know, disillusioned freedom lovers and, and voluntarists who don't understand how to communicate well or are having trouble communicating well with statists. It was designed to help them bridge that gap, but making anarchy mainstream is kind of for everyone in that now there's this new, you know, thanks but no thanks to the government government scam bullshit in the last couple of years. A lot of people are now, in, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, newly um, questioning and curious and awake and aware people, but and who are kind of new to the idea of, you know, being completely apolitical and all the way outside of that box, but they aren't immediately going to have the tools to communicate either, and they're also going to be immediately in the same place a lot of us were when we first became awake, which is frustrated and wanting to shut down immediately because they think, oh my God, I everyone around me that I know isn't going to listen and I and now, I'm now aware of the world as it is and I just came online so I'm thinking everything's horrible. A lot of us who have been here are like, no, it's going great. And so many of us are awake now. There's thousands of us. And so making Anarchy Mainstream will also help a lot more people to um, quickly grab onto something that's actually a reason to hope and not just assume that that you can't just go out and change the world and and change people's minds and talk to them and that people aren't receptive because they are and there's a lot of ways where it's easier to do that than you think. But you, you have to do it in certain ways and that's, that's yeah, the point of that. the seminars because if you just go out and scream at people and they go, oh, you're weird and run away, then you go home frustrated. That didn't accomplish much. Right, so the it, seminar teaches how, first of all, why it's worth speaking up at all and what the message actually needs to be. Because there's a lot of things that people talk about that aren't really doing any good. Even if they're true, they're not doing any good. And then how to actually get the message to people. Of course, Candles in the Dark is one of them. By the way, Candles in the Dark still exists online. Yes. Attendcandles.com um, gets, gets you that for life. And subscribers of the Rose oh. Channel also get it. Yeah, subscribers to the Rose Channel get Candles in the Dark, but Candles in the Dark was our hefty, like, two-day-long, we're talking six to eight hours or more each day of the seminar, depending on if you count all the talking that happened afterwards, and that was extensive, whereas this one at Anarchapulco this year, Making Anarchy Mainstream, I think is going to be like, what, a three-hour thing or yeah. something? And there is it's there is a little bit short. of overlap, um, but it goes way beyond just one-on-one -on -one conversations because Candles in the Dark is all about training your own psyche so you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with statists that are actually useful and not stressful and annoying and stuff. Um, but making anarchy mainstream is goes a lot beyond that too. So be there and do that and learn that and then use what you learn to make the world anarchist. Um, we will also be, I think we agreed to be, side note, at Anarchapulco, not only um, in certain, uh, like we're doing our things there, the seminar, and then he's doing a talk, and um, and we'll also be presenting the Jones Plantation, but we're going to be also a part of, there's the Ron Paul, I think, speaker or VIP dinner that people can pay to go to. 
um, we may have agreed to be a part of that as well. So yeah, I we're think at that, some table and people yeah. can pay to that. Okay, so also, if you're not aware that that's a thing, that is already a thing with Anarchapolco. I'm not sure if you can buy the tickets to that, but they may be up. You can go to the website and look, and we'll also be a part of that. So you can, if you want to be one of the few people that gets a seat at the dinner, you can like be at a table with us, potentially. Okay. So you mentioned it, but with not nearly enough grandstanding <laughs> that the Jones Plantation, the movie, will be screened at Anarchapolco the first week of February. Um, as far as I know, it's the first time it's going to be shown anywhere. Um, we're frantically working. Well, now it's not we because I'm done the music. Um, they're still working on the sound and the color and stuff and the final touches. It's all edited. It's all shot. All that fun stuff is done. But that's the first time people are ever going to see it on a big screen. Um, we're really excited about it because this has been... A lot of work, especially on our director, Andrew. So yeah. if you have a lot of appreciation for Larkin, uh, for what he's done and his part of the Jones Plantation, as far as the writing, the script, frantically rewriting the script and also having to write a novel, also direct as much or more uh, with this movie, a lot about the actual movie part, just at the director and also the cast and crew. They, yeah. oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And Andrew will be there. Um, Doug will be there too. Awesome. You guys don't have a reason to know who he, that is, but he's awesome and very instrumental in Doug making is the Doug movie is happen. Andrew's right hand man. So, yeah. like they were kind of the the team for the Jones Plantation. And you guys, if you've been paying attention, a lot of you have seen the behind the scenes stuff. If you haven't, go out there and YouTube Jones Plantation BTS. There's some uh, Andrew's we, posted stuff. We can stick links under this too. So yes, people will be seeing that movie for the first time. Um, at Anarchapulco. Yeehaw. Oh, and he was just heads down for a month doing the score for it. Um, and that's kind of what a bunch of people were basically helping fund him doing was because he doesn't, he didn't have a way to get paid to do that, but he had to do it. And he was basically just in creative mode in the studio, having to knock out a movie score. Um, to give you guys some scale of why I'm impressed with this guy is, <laughs> he won't say it, but I'm impressed because I'm like, he did in musical composition scoring like that that whole thing he did what composers that are paid millions of dollars have like a year to do he did that in a month and month and a half a, a month and a half and i'm a little bit biased but because i'm a musician and i have a a musician brain that understands high information music his score is also like there's way more to it as well than like a lot of the major way overpaid dudes get to make way simpler but massive you know scores for for movies his was actually more substantive and there's a lot more to it and yet he did it in, in a, a fraction of the time and i understand the creative output and energy that took and it was ridiculous so you guys should i'm hope i hope you guys are impressed with the movie because it... i'm still waiting to see <laughs> what the soundtrack ends up like because the director and the sound guy are two other people, and they're they're the ones with the final say on everything. So I don't even <laughs> I don't know how much of it they're using. I don't know how it's going to be made. Yeah, we're like excited so, about it, and we love it. But also keep thing, in mind I'm it like, could be now it's in somebody else's hands. I hope they do a version that I like. Um, yeah, we're I, excited about it, but it's like it could. We're excited about how it is right now. It could change. Because they, like he said, they have oversight over the score. It's not like he makes the score and then he goes, I lurk and Rose decided this is the movie spooky. score. Like, for those who do get how movie stuff works, you already know this. But, like, for those who don't, we hand it off and there is a sound guy. And then there's the director and they could decide to use half got, the score he made. We got an award-winning sound guy um, who really knows what he's doing. And... So anyway, there's the Andrews pulled off a number of miracles to make it a really dang good movie, um, and doing a bunch of things, ways I wouldn't have done it, which made it better than if I had done it. That's why you get a director to direct a movie because <laughs> he actually knows what he's doing. So we're gonna see it there. I think we're also gonna ask for people's feedback and stuff because, um, like the huge budget movies, they can do small screenings and make little modifications or additions or stuff if if. People say, oh, we weren't clear on this, or we didn't like that, or whatever. Um, so you may actually be able to influence it, or you can just watch it and go, holy smokes, that was profound. 
Um, but that's the first place in the world normal people are ever going to see Jones Plantation. So that's another reason you should be there. Um, also, the the a song that's been in the works that we have called Dawn of the Free, we may actually have it done in time to premiere it. Just I don't know if it'll be like right before my, I don't even know when or where. It's, it's kind a, of there, There's a lot of emotion around everything going on right now because there was a lot put into the Jones Plantation on his part. And then we've been working on the song Dawn of the Free, which he kind of um, threw it out there at the end there. But the song Dawn of the Free, like the Jones Foundation is a huge deal. But Dawn of the Free is a big deal to us. Um, yeah, we us. released The Beast Behind. Um, that's on all the musical platforms. If you haven't heard that song, go listen to it. But we released The Beast Behind, and that was all him. I sang it. You heard me on it. But that was the writing and the lyrics were him and, and the musical composition. Dawn of the Free came from, uh, The Beast Behind was recent. Dawn of the Free is the one we're about, we want to release. And that, we started writing in 2017, before Anarchopolco 2018. <laughs> and he sent me this, like, just the bass, like, a, um, there was a few tracks of, of musical instruments that were, like, the bass core of the song. And it was much simpler than it is now. It's, like, like now it's, like, a... It is basically a 30-part orchestration now, the song. 32. Um, th oh, okay. <laughs> 32. If My dream is to have this thing actually done by a real orchestra with me singing and him performing the parts he can perform um, on the chord. One and that would be freaking... 32. That would be freaking cool. Yeah. And so he, but he composed it because, you know, you have this, you have sound at your fingertips with audio engineering now. So he composed a bunch of the song. He needed me to do the melody and hear the melody and lyrics over it. And I don't, uh, as a creative musician, I don't have a lot of the, the, um, I would call it the stuff, the, the, the music stuff knowledge. I'm the creative musician that's more by ear and that hasn't like learned music theory fully and didn't like bother to develop fully what I know on like instruments very well. Like I can play a little bit of piano, but I'm a beginner. I can play a little bit of violin, but I haven't gotten anywhere yet with that. I'm a beginner. Um, but my musicianship is in my ear and my singing. And so the melody was really cool for me because I just sort of, in 2018, I just sort of channeled the melody out of me. I just heard it, the melody that should go over the song and the lyrics, and he needed me to do that. He needed me to bring the lyrics and melody to it. And then about a year ago, not uh, almost a year ago now, he we want, decided we wanted to expand it and finish it up. And it's been, because he's been doing the Jones Plantation stuff and everything else we've been doing and working on our property of North and all this stuff, it's been like a long Back time burn. coming that we've been able to get around to fully fleshing out Dawn of the Free and expanding it into this song that's as good as it can be for the music platforms. Because when you can record in studio, you can do stuff you can't do live. We can make it into this big song. So he added a whole section to it and then was like, here, you need new lyrics and a weirder melody for this part, Amanda. Add on some more that. homework. Um, so the last <laughs> several months, I was creatively struggling because... As you creatives know, the more your heart and your soul is invested in your own piece of art, the more it also can, that investment and desire for it to be good can get in the way sometimes of your own ability to be creative because you're sort of overthinking and stressing out about it and you can't think. And so for a while, it just, it was a, it was a struggle for me to really channel and hear and figure out what I wanted this last part of the song to be because I don't. I don't build music by the notes and by, you know, A, B, C, D and the, the actual names of the notes. I build music from hearing it and feeling it. And I had to do it with my musical intelligent brain. And I got it recently and we and freaking recorded it like three days ago. And he's already in the process now. Just he just finished the Jones Plantation score. And this guy's already like a lot of the way done through mixing Dawn of the Free now that I recorded it. And it's also it. when you say mixing it, if people don't know what's in it. Like, a lot of songs are, well, there's going to be a guitar and a vocal and maybe drums. It's like, okay, mixing will take an hour and a half. Well, right. maybe a little more than that. But this has a huge orchestral arrangement and everything. Anyway, don't need to go on and on about it, but that's awesome. By the way, the last part you wrote is my favorite part of the song. Um, so it was worth taking the time. Anyway, we hope to play that sometime at Anarchapulco. I don't know when and where. That's not even scheduled as a thing, but we shall see. Yeah, so, he, just, he just came up with the idea because by the time we're at Anarchapulco, it'll be on the music platforms and we could play it through some big main speakers to yeah. show it. 
So that and my talk and our seminar and the freaking Jones Plantation being shown for the first time, those are pretty good reasons to be at Anarchapulco. The For the millionth time, what I always have the most fun doing is just having a million little random conversations off to the side with whoever shows up. And I don't even know the location we're going to be at. I mean, I'm not familiar with it because it's not at the, the old locations. Um, but I'm going to find a niche somewhere and just be there most of the time and talk to whoever wanders by. And that's always, there's always the program going on. And then there's me hiding in a corner most of the time. Side note. Us hiding in a corner. I have been in communication with uh, Lily Forrester uh, about Anarchapulco. Um, and uh, there will be, I think there's going to be like an event or a dinner thing with like the cast of the anarchists from HBO. And this that I'm wearing is Lily Forrester's lovely hat. And I've had like three different women in the last two weeks, two, three weeks be like, where'd you get that hat? I need one. And like, I had to actually stop and show them who she was. It's, so they it's could an get octopus. There. If anybody yeah, can't guess it's that. A, it's an octopus. So this is Lily Forrester's fine crochet work. And I'm just showing it off in this video. But if you aren't aware that this is what she's capable of, um, you can continue to help her pay the bills by giving her a giant backlog of orders that she can just barely keep up with. So yeah, there, there's another reason to go. So uh, yeah, that's about it. Hope to see you there. Um, it'll be awesome in lots of different ways. And as usual, a bunch of stuff we do, we do for free. Like Dawn of the Free is just going to be flung out on Spotify for free when it's done. So yeah. if people want to donate to help us do all the stuff that we do for free, that is hugely appreciated. It appreciated and it helps us to do more of that stuff that we couldn't necessarily do if there weren't people helping us out because spending lots and lots of time working on a song that nobody's paying for <laughs> is kind of risky when it's like, I hope we can make rent. Wait, I'm setting up the side chain for the vocal through the... Uh. Yeah, it's, it's... Well, every creative knows it's a risk and a struggle often to be a creative because often you're trying yeah. to juggle what produces income for your overbearing bills versus your art and creativity that, you know, may in theory one day actually help with those bills yeah. as well. And lots of people say, well, you should just do what you do and give it away for free and then ask for donations. Well, if you're one of the people who say that, then make sure you do the second part of that if you want the people who do, who follow that model to actually keep doing it. Um, and by the way, it has, it freaking works. Like the new, the new internet economy of giving, of everybody, you know, it's like YouTubers and people who put out content, but also people who are connected in a network. We're all supporting each other. We're all each other's commerce now around government. And so effectively what a lot of people did was reach out to Larkin and I and even message us and let us know directly like, hey, you know, we saw you guys letting us know you guys need help. We know that you guys are doing a lot right now and you have, you know, big bills. And a bunch of people heard that and just gave and understood. And that is, for us, that's literally making the world go round for us. I mean, it is yeah. this community, as big as it's gotten, connected to us, supporting our creative and productive output constantly it is essentially our job now and you guys basically paid us to do it because you heard that call which was awesome and a bunch of people heard the call of like oh if everybody gives little donations little bits all the time it's really freaking helpful well that time the algorithms like let everybody get the video and a bunch of people in the last few months really helped us out yeah. and he was able to produce the score for the Jones Plantation in huge part because a bunch of you did that um, and so it's really been helping and we're not out of the woods yet but that Jones Plantation is about to be done and Dawn of the Free is about to be done and we're going to be at Anarchapulco so I'll yeah. see you there be there or be a statist <laughs>